Okay, so last time we were all together, we talked about pH, just barely brushed on it. Now we know, we know that in a neutral solution of water, at least uh, you may not know it, I for sure told you, all right? In a neutral water, so pure, pure water, the concentration of H3O plus equals 1 times 10 to the negative 7. Remember this little uh, symbology here means concentration of H3O plus in molarity. So this, this number is in molarity moles per liter. The concentration of OH minus is also 1 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. So that's molarity. So in pure water, those two things are the same. Now, in acidic water, this number gets larger. So the exponent here will get smaller. You feel me? So when the water becomes acidic, you're adding protons to it. The hydronium, H3O plus, the number will get smaller. Oh, sorry, the number will get larger. So the exponent must get smaller. For example, 1 times 10 to the negative 5 molar is acidic. Why is it acidic? Because it has 1 times 10 to the negative 5 molar. The negative 5 is a larger number than the negative 7. So this concentration goes up. Now, in a basic solution, the concentration of hydronium goes down. So for example, 1 times 10 to the negative 10 molar equals the concentration of hydronium is basic. Because this number is smaller than that number. Okay? So it's a basic solution. Now look at these numbers here. 7, 5, and 10. Now the 5 and 10 could be anywhere between 0 and 14. Well, let's just look at the 5, 10, and the 7. If you're neutral, your concentration of hydronium will be 1 times 10 to the negative 7. If you're acidic, in our example, you'll have a concentration of hydronium that's 1 times 10 to the negative 5 because the number's larger, so the exponent has to be smaller. The bottom example, 1 times 10 to the negative 10, that's a very small concentration of hydronium. That solution will be basic. Okay, now, everyone in this room, because of an exam, you're all tired and mad at me and all that stuff, this is really hard to do. Look, they'll look at these numbers and go, okay, what's, okay, which one's smaller? The, the exponent gets smaller, the number gets bigger, my mind's going to explode. Nobody likes looking at these kind of numbers. So we've come up with a better way. It's called the pH scale. pH, if you need to know, it's on your formula sheet. You may have seen it there today. You didn't need to use it, but it was there. The negative log of the concentration of, oops, of the concentration of H3O plus. So if you know the concentration of H3O plus, you simply take the negative log of it. And your little calculator has a logarithm button on it. So now, if for example, we took the, if we had the pure water again, so pure water, concentration of H3O plus equals 1 times 10 to the negative 7 molar. If we plug it into the pH formula, it's the negative log of 1 times 10 to the negative 7, and that number will be simply the number 7. Okay? So if you have a pH of 7, you're neutral. Okay? None of this 1 times 10 to the negative 7 business, pH is 7. Pure water, absolutely pure, no contaminants, is pH 7. Okay? If you're acidic, for our example here, if you're acidic, what's that? I wouldn't be greater than seven. Be smaller than seven. So if you're acidic, let's just say so one times ten to the negative five molar. If we plug it into the formula, pH 
equals the negative log of 1 times 10 to the negative 5, you will find the answer is 5. So wait a minute now. If the pH is 7, that's neutral. If I'm acidic, I'm below 7. The exponent is smaller, it's below 7. Right? See how this little scale kind of works a little bit? All right, now what if you're basic? If you're basic, your concentration of hydronium is small. So there's a small number for the concentration of hydronium. It's a tiny number. Hardly anything there. So that's going to be pH equals the negative log of the concentration of, hydro of hydro <laughs> hydronium. To do these out in your calculator, you'll get these exact numbers, same as I am. Okay? So there. This is a basic solution. The concentration of hydronium is less than 1 times 10 to the negative 7. And for this particular measurement, our pH would be 10. It all has to do with the exponents. That's where these numbers are coming from. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. It all comes from the exponents. So now, I think everyone in this room would agree. If I said this solution that I have in my imaginary solution I have in my hands, if this solution has a pH of 6, you guys will automatically say that beaker is acidic. Right? Now, if I said it's... The concentration of hydronium is 1 times 10 to the negative 6. You have to think about that for a minute. Yes, that will be acidic. But if I just say it's 6, everyone in this room instantly says acidic. Everybody. It's on video here too, right? I shouldn't have done that. Oh well. So. The lights go down. This go ball comes from the same <laughs> Smooth jazz. All right, so don't know where I was. Don't know where I was there. All right, let's just go for it. Uh oh. Oh no. Uh oh, oh, my emergency repairs on my little remote didn't work. No, say it's not so. Oh no. Get a good one. All right, let's look at this little diagram together, shall we? And I know it's hard to see. It's also in your book. It's just exact pictures in your book, so please take a look at it. It's actually kind of a nice little uh, chart. Please notice that most of our foods are at the top. It's the oranges, Coca-Cola, bread, cheese, and all that kind of stuff. Our food is normally acidic. Humans have evolved, I guess, to enjoy the flavor of acidic food. Isn't that neat? We like acidic food, we just do. Notice that on the bottom, we have things like water detergent, cleaners, and brain cleaners. Basic things. Basic things are generally, but not always, used as cleaners. Generally, but not always. There are some acidic cleaners too. Okay? And in fact, I used to work at a, uh, a food plant. We used to bottle uh, fruit juice, and uh, actually five hour energy, we bottled it there too. When we had to flush the lines and clean it out, we would actually flush it with hot, concentrated base. We would flush the stainless steel lines up with that to clean it. That's the best, single best way to clean anything, is with hot, concentrated base, except for glass. Don't clean glass with concentrated base, you'll probably not like the result. Okay, now, that's pretty cool I think, right? Let's do a problem real quick and then we'll move on to something more fun. And I got nothing. Nothing to work with today. I'll make one up for you. I don't know what's wrong with my slides. They're kind of not working. But I'll just make up a problem. Okay, this is the kind of problem you'll, you may see on the next exam, which I guess is the final. These questions are really easy. It's usually the first question on the exam. Kind of get you in the mood. All right, what if? What? Is the pH of a solution that has a concentration of hydronium equal to one times ten to the negative? Uh, let's make it a little more interesting. Let's make it three point two times ten to the negative four. Okay? 
Now, you'll look on your formula sheet, you'll find this formula. pH equals the negative log of the concentration of hydronium. So you just go find that formula, plug the numbers in, it's kind of making sure you know how to use your calculator too. And then I would say, is this solution acidic or basic? And then I would say, give me a, I'll just say why after that. Why? Okay? So grab your calculator if you got it. Now everyone's calculator, unfortunately, because we have like the old school calculators that I was brought up on are still around because they're still very nice calculators. The newer ones don't follow the same rules. So now, if you don't get the right answer, I do not have time to do it with you right now. You can see me immediately after class and I'll go over it with you how to use your particular calculator, but I cannot take the time today to do it. Okay? So if you have any trouble getting the right answer with your calculator, I am more than happy after class to show you. All right, so now, using that formula, and I will grab up my iPhone calculator, we type in the number, 3.2 exponent minus 4, minus oops, exponent. Four. Plus minus five. There it is. Equals. And let me take the log of that. Log. I get. Maybe you guys have a different number. I get three point four nine is the pH. Three point four nine is the pH I get from that number. If you didn't get that number, that's okay. Just write it down. We'll get to you after the lecture is over. And I'll show you how to do it on a calculator. It's easy, trust me, it's easy. Just some calculators are finicky how they want to type in. Okay, so now we got the pH of 3.49. Immediately looking at that pH, you say that this solution is? Acidic. Acidic. The number is less than 7. So if you have a pH of 6.9, you're acidic. Not very acidic, but you are acidic. If your pH is 7.1, you're basic. Not very basic, but more or less basic. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Simple, right? Looking at these numbers, I think everyone will agree, is much easier than looking at the 1 times 10 to the negative 10 stuff. I mean, that's, I mean, I can do it, but I'd rather use pH. It's much simpler. Okay? And people immediately know what you're trying to say to them at that point. Where are all my learning <laughs> They were here a minute ago. Anyway, so that was simple pH calculations. I went over it pretty quick because it really is that simple. That is acidic. Anything below seven is acidic. All right, reactions of acids and base. These are kind of fun. These are kind of fun. We'll go over them. There's only two of them. So we'll go over them real quick. Ah, there's three of them actually. Sorry, three. So reactions of acids and bases. Now I think everyone in this room has gone to a party, friends and family, drinks are being passed around and tons of food. Everybody in here has probably eaten too much in their lifetime. And when you eat too much, your little belly gives you problems. It gurgles and spits and you get acid reflux. And it hurts. And you want it to go away. What do you do? You could drink milk, but there's a better way. You could lay down, but you want to continue eating and party. <laughs> the thing you put on water? It's called Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. What were you saying? And acid. Tums. Mm -hmm. But, if you're old school like me, baking powder. <laughs> <laughs> old school, baby. Tastes like crap, but it works. Now, <laughs> Tums, Alka-Seltzer, all those antacids are basically different ways of taking sodium bicarbonate. Now Tom's and some of the other big manufacturers have changed it from sodium bicarbonate to magnesium bicarbonate or magnesium carbonate for obvious reasons. Magnesium is an essential mineral. Sodium people try to cut it from their diet so they put in magnesium carbonate or magnesium bicarbonate. Same thing, different cation, right? So it's going to give you the same result. That make sense? Let me show it to you on the board. When you have an upset belly, the HCL in your stomach gurgles, comes up into your esophagus and starts to burn. It's supposed to hurt. You take Tums or some other, oops, some other antacid, or if you're like me, sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. That 
will react in your belly to give you NaCl plus CO2 plus H2O. And this is a gas. So this is a acid carbonate reaction. So bicarbonate or so bicarbonate or, bi or carbonate. Either one. We'll do the same thing. The reaction is a little different with carbonate though, but don't, we won't worry about that too much. They both make CO2. That's the key. They both make carbon dioxide. So if you take a couple of tongs, that's why you kind of have to belch afterwards. At least I sometimes do. Because you're building up a concentration of carbon dioxide in your stomach. So it has to go out. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it can totally belch out. If not, you'll have a perforated bowel. Not fun, right? So that's the first type of reaction I want to show you. It's a gas forming reaction and it forms CO2. Alright? Does that make sense? Or can you accept that? I know it probably doesn't make much sense, but can you accept it? Okay, so next time you need to go, you know, to the store and buy some tom to tom 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 or rollies. Get up the baking powder. Save yourself a trip. Anyway, yeah? Is there a specific name for this reaction? Um reactions of acids with carbonates. Yes. Reactions with carbonates, called that. They form CO2, that's the big key. They form CO2. Alright, next. If you take an acid and a metal. Now you guys who took lab with me, or took lab on this campus, have witnessed this. If you take an acid and a metal. Now not all metals will do this, but most of them do. An acid plus a metal, here's magnesium, you will form hydrogen gas. HG, that's mercury. Whew. One of them days. There we go. Hydrogen gas plus magnesium chloride. Alright? So you form hydrogen. This is a second gas forming reaction. So these are two what they call gas forming reactions. One forms CO2, the other forms hydrogen. Okay? So literally, some of you I think I did this for, uh, when the lab kind of gets uh, a little quieter, I sometimes can do this experiment. You throw in a little HCl, a little magnesium, and you get a whole bunch of bubbling H2. If you got some gumption, you take a burning match, put it inside the little test tube where you're making it, and it goes poof, because the hydrogen explodes. It's kind of fun, as long as no one gets killed, right? All right, that, just accept that, that's all it is. They're just two gas forming reactions, no big deal. On an exam, the kind of questions you might get are, if you react HCl with bicarbonate, what gas do you form? you form CO2. If you react HCl with a metal, what gas do you form? You form hydrogen. That's, those are the kind of questions I might ask you there. Okay? Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. Uh, that'll, if you're going to see that, it'll be multiple choice stuff. Okay? Alrighty then. Moving right along. We are moving along here. Let's go to this part. Buffers. Yes, buffers. We're behind, so we got to move forward in the class. So I'm, I'm just touching the high points. And by, what I mean by high points is you can expect to see on the sand. High points. Buffers. Now, when you have an acids and bases, say for example, I have a big old meter beaker here filled with pure water. You stick in a pH meter. They have these meters that will actually measure pH for us. Stick a pH meter in there. And the pH reads 7.0. So I'm very proud of my water. It's neutral. It's absolutely pure. My water. One of you all sneak down here when I'm not looking and pour in some base. And then you jerks. Now, what happens is the pH of that solution will go up dramatically, no matter how much you add. Well, it matters how much you add. But if you just add a few milliliters, or even say 50 milliliters to that liter, the pH will go up. Dramatically, it'll go. It'll probably go to like seven. It'll go from seven to say nine. That's a big jump. That's annoying to me because I want my water to be pure. If, you, on the other hand, instead of adding base, you add an acid, the pH will plummet, maybe down to two. Hmm. Very little amounts of acid or base make dramatic changes in the pH. It just fluctuates rapidly. So, in order to alleviate that. We've come up with these things called buffers. Buffers are simply an acid and a conjugate base combination. 
Remember what we talked about last time? The asset always has its conjugate base. It mixes them together in the, in the right proportion. And you can make what's called a buffer. Now, let's imagine I had that same beaker here, but I made it in a buffered solution. So I added some acid and some buffer and some uh, conjugate base to it. So I had a nice, equal, a nice uh, reaction going on in there. The pH was stable at 7.0, 50 meter in there. And then one of you guys can be out here with your base and dump it in there. Well, the pH might go to 6.9 at that point. It wouldn't jump dramatic. Uh, sorry, 7.1. It wouldn't jump dramatically. It would go up incrementally, a very small amount. If that same person, instead of adding base, added acid, the pH will go down a very small amount, say 6.9. You get what I'm saying? A buffer resists changes to pH. It, just resists, it, it will resist it. Now, that doesn't mean that's infinite. You can't do that forever. For example, if you came down here with enough base, you would what's called blow the buffer, and the, and the pH would just skyrocket. But within a certain criteria, within a certain volumes, the pH will stay the same. <coughs> Now, why is that important? Well, your body is one big pH body. Your blood, especially, is very good at keeping its pH. I think blood is about 7.4, 7.4? Don't remember. 7.3? Your blood's very good at staying there. If your blood goes too acidic, that ain't good. If it goes too basic, that's not good either. Your body has developed a method, and you learn all about it physiology, to keep the pH right around 7.3, 7.4. Okay? Your body's good at that. All of your cells are good at it. All of your intestinal juices and everything in your body is usually pretty good at maintaining a pH. So, write that down for me, please. A buffer works because if it just is a change in pH from the addition of acid or base, and in the body it can absorb the acid or the base that's given to us from the food we eat and from the cellular processes that go on in our body. Third point, they are extremely important to proper cell function and for the blood. All right? So write all that down. Those are the points. The big one is on an exam, you might get a question on the multiple choice that says something like this. What is a buffer and what does it do? And you would say, a buffer is a solution that maintains a proper pH even upon the addition of acid or bases. Dude, something like that. Basically what it says right there. Okay? That's probably all I'm going to ask you about. It. Now, I used to go over how to calculate buffers and how to make them. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of this course. It's more of a general of a chemistry one topic. So I don't do it here. It's enough for me to, it's enough for this class that you know what a buffer is and what it does. Okay, and that's it. There's no math involved in buffers in this class. Okay? Is that fair? Excellent. chapter on that, but I'm hitting the high points. The stuff that I guarantee you, maybe, will be on your exam. Yeah, I guarantee you that I back off. Because <laughs> I can't guarantee it. Because if it's not there, then they'll come and sue me for a breach of contract. I ain't good. Okay, so that's what a buffer is, and that's kind of what it does, and that's why they're important. And that's basically the end of chapter uh, 8. We're going to go into chapter 9 immediately. We're going to try to get through most of chapter 9 today. Chapter 9 is not very long, uh, but it is a little weird. And why is it weird, you might ask? It's all about nuclear chemistry. And that's just plain weird. Everybody got it? People texting, so we're going to be done. That? I am looking at people's writing. Maybe you're writing a note <laughs> to your friend. I think we'll do that anymore. Right? <laughs> no. <laughs> we we text. text. <laughs> Y'all know what the same thing is about this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
is actually, I think, rather fun. It's a really easy because you know, we're not going to dive deep into natural radiation, but we are going to talk about it. Now, here we have this nice young Broward student heading off to chemistry class, diligently thinking about his work, and he's being bombarded by these Greek letters, alpha, beta, and gamma. I always start off this lecture by asking one simple question. Who here is afraid of radiation? One person is going to, oh, two people in one minute. Three people. Four. They're terrified of radiation. And we know from comic books that if you get irradiated, you get superhuman strength. So that's what we all want, right? Now, in reality, radiation is dangerous in high doses, but we are constantly being bombarded by radiation. From the ground, from the atmosphere, from the universe, we're just being hit by it, and our body is designed to take it to a certain degree. So don't be too frightened of it, but have a healthy respect for it. Now, our, what, what's up? What about chemo patient? Is that like the same radiation? Chemo? Chemo is not radiation. Chemo is chemical, radiation, radi radiotherapy is radiation. No, we have for the radio radiation therapy, mm -hmm. is it? Yeah, well, they're dying of cancer. So what medicine does typically is they have what's called a, uh, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, they look at the ratios. Basically, the cancer is going to kill you in five years, the radiation is going to kill you in 20. Give them radiation. That's why they do that. Anyway, so we have alpha, beta, and gamma. That's weird. Alpha. Symbol like this, like a Jesus fish. Beta, a weird kind of B, and gamma. I guess that's the symbol for breast cancer nowadays. Okay, now. In your life, you've been exposed to all of them. Alpha and beta pretty routinely. Gamma, usually when you go to get an x-ray or the dentist or whatnot, they give you a little bit of gamma rays, I believe. Now, they're all different. They're all different. Alpha particles are helium particles. Helium-4-2. Okay? So alpha is helium. Helium with a mass number of four. Beta particles are electrons. Okay? Beta particles are simply electrons. And gamma rays are simply, well, they're not simply anything, but they are energy. For this class, we just define gamma rays as energy. Okay? Now, alpha and beta particles are not simply energy. There's energy associated with them, but they have mass. Helium and electrons, as you all remember, have a mass. They have, they're physical, they exist. Energy, uh, although it does exist, um, has, I don't want to say it doesn't have a mass, but it has uh, a minuscule, indistinguishable mass. It's not that important. All right, so write these three bullet points down real quick. Radioactive isotope. Isotope, there's that word again has an unstable nucleus. The nucleus of the, of the isotope is not stable, so it's going to decompose. It emits, aha, that nasty word, radiation, to become more stable. <coughs> and it's identified by its mass number. So, when a radioactive isotope becomes unstable, it's going to emit one 
or some other thing of these things. Now, there are more than these three, but these are the three we're going to talk about in this class. There are more of them. There are more. Okay? So, first of all, not all atoms of a particular element are radioactive. Everyone in this room has probably heard of uranium or plutonium. Well, plutonium probably is radioactive, but uranium, they're not all radioactive. There's a lot of uh, uranium atoms out there that are not radioactive at all. They just sit there on the ground looking all cool, and they don't emit any radiation because they're not radioactive. There are some, though, of uranium that are radioactive. They will emit radiation. Okay? So you have to have the right mass number to be radioactive. Is that kind of okay with everybody? That's what they said they are uh, going to enrich the uranium. Yep, when they, they said are, they're going to enrich the uranium. They are unstable to yep. the stable to all. That's what they're trying to do is, is have more of the unstable ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that's my, you're, you're uh, tapping into my rudimentary knowledge of nuclear physics. I'm not a nuclear physicist. But I play one on TV. <laughs> and I did sleep with a Holiday Inn Express last night. All right, radiation. Go ahead and write that down for me. Radiation emitted by the unstable nucleus. And there's a whole bunch of different types, but we're going to stick with alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Okay? So there's more than just those that I've talked about. So does nuclear weapons are made of nuclear weapons? Uh, nuclear weapons, I'm not really sure what they're made of. I think plutonium. But I, I, I wasn't on the Manhattan Project, so I don't know. <laughs> What's that? No, it's uh, we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute. Well, not in a minute. Probably today or maybe early next class. Oh, goodness. So, it's just a little bit of preamble. you got to get the, the definition straight. And once we get those straight, we'll move on to something a little more fun. <laughs> now, I do require you to know what alpha, beta, and gamma particles are. So, make sure you uh, put those to memory. <coughs> Yep, helium-42 is alpha, beta is an electron, stuff like that. It's really not hard, it's just got a river. You know I mean? do 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 don't write, don't write the table, just write the term. We can go, go, go. How are we doing out there? Everyone got it? Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Radiation protection. Write everything here now. This might be important sometime in your career. Now, when you're working with radioactivity, and someone pointed out that cancer patients sometimes go into radiotherapy, the person doing the test on you, you, he or she wants to protect themselves from the radiation because they're exposed to it every day, more than once usually. So you got to protect them from it. And how do we do that? Well, proper clothing. You have to wear clothes when you go to work anyway, so you may as well have proper clothing on. For alpha particles, that's usually just clothing. Just stuff. Just wear your clothes. So, is that, I'm sorry, is that supposed to be proper or paper? Paper. Oh. Sorry. Paper and clothing. So if you want to block an alpha particle, piece of paper in front of you. Basically, alpha particles are helium atoms. If you hold a piece of paper in front of a, so on a helium tank and turn on the helium, you can see the paper will move because the helium hit it, right? So if you have an alpha particle coming at you, hold a piece of paper in front of it. Now, I would probably go a little higher than that, maybe a brick, but paper should do it, right? Now, with beta particles, they're a little more serious. There, they, they want you to wear a lab coat, gloves, probably even a, some kind of something on your face to make sure you don't get splattered on. Those are for beta. I've always been told that alpha, you can use paper. Beta, you want to use wood, like uh, an inch thick plywood or something like that. That's what I've always been told. However, whenever I work with beta, I've used lead, because I you know, don't want to die. Uh, lead shield, that's for gamma, typically. The third point down, lead shield and thick concrete, that's for gamma rays. Most people have had x-rays in their lives. Have you ever noticed? That the guy or the girl giving the x-ray runs behind the brick wall? That's why. Not because it's, not because it's unsafe for you and you don't want to get more than a few, but that person giving you the radiation gets exposed constantly. So 
So they've got to run behind the brick wall to get away from it. And the brick wall is there to protect them from the radiation. So that's why they run, they scurry away. If you go to the dentist, they're even better. They, run behind, they just go outside the room and they cut it. And they go, Bzzz, you know, make that noise. If you're gonna die. Oh, they don't fix that noise. We know what dentists is old school. The other points, the bottom one, are the best, actually. Limit your time around the source. So if something's radioactive and you don't need to be there, don't be there. For example, if you're working in a hospital and a room says radioactive storage and you have absolutely no business going in that room, don't. Just stay out of it. Limit your exposure by not being there. And if you have to be near a radioactive source, get away from it. Get as far away from it as you can and still do your job. That's why the little guy or the girl runs behind the wall. They leave you and they go behind the wall and they, get, they put distance and thickness between you and the source. This is for safety reasons. I have a question. Yeah? So the uh, cancer patient using radiation is a different type? No. Nope. Probably down. But how come when they say you can't stay in it, but then they use it? Well, they're not giving you a mega dose. Just, and they're, they're focusing it on the cancer cells. They're, well, they're hopefully focusing it. And they're not giving you a huge dose of radiation. Like if you were at Chernobyl, for example, and it melted down, um, those people died pretty quick because you got a mega dose right at one time. Cancer patients don't get anywhere near that. Or at least they better not, or they won't make it today. All right. <laughs> Balancing the nuclear equation. Now, these, what I'm going to do now, are pretty important. <clears throat> Do I say that a lot? <clears throat> Pretty important. Pretty important. Now, if we're going to have, say, CF251, and it's going to lose alpha. So, CF251, and it's going to emit alpha. Now on an exam, this is the kind of question I would get. I know the answer is right there, but try to follow along with me here. This is how you solve this. This is the kind of question I would give you on an exam. This element with this mass number loses helium-4,2, that's alpha. So the first question I might say is, what particle is that? And you would say, this is alpha. And then I would say, what product forms from this nuclear decay? If this element or isotope of CF loses helium-4,2, what are the products of that reaction? And it's easy. It's easier than balancing a chemical reaction. First thing I would do is go find CF on the periodic table. I look for CF, CF, here it is. CF is right down here, one of the ghosted elements. Its atomic number is 98. Now on here, it's written there. Sometimes you'll see it, just like we did mass number things. Sometimes you'll see the, the atomic number, sometimes you won't. Okay? So if it's not there, you'll always have a periodic table, come and find it. CF is element 98. So let's write that in, just so we have it. Element 98. Now, we're going to lose from element 98 two protons, right? Because helium is going to be ejected from the nucleus, and it's going to take two protons with it. Does that make sense? Okay, the nucleus is unstable, it emits an alpha particle, so two helium, sorry, two protons leave. Is that good? Yes. Okay, so we had 98 protons, and two of them left. How many do we have, how many do we have now in our nucleus? 96. 96. So this is element 96, this is going to be our product. So we go back to the periodic table, and we say, what on earth is element 96? And we see it's element CM. CM, which I believe is curium. So we write CM right here. And then we say, wait a minute, we're not quite done yet. Not only did we lose two protons, we have a mass number of four. We lost two neutrons as well, didn't we? Mass number is four means it has helium-4,2, has two neutrons and two protons, right? Mm -hmm. Ever remember that? We lost two neutrons as well. So our mass number is going to change dramatically. It's going to lose four. So 251 minus 4 is 247. So we're going to form curium 247. Does that make sense? Check yourself, make sure you're right. All you got to do, add this, 96 plus 2 equals 98. 247 plus 4 equals 251. You're right. You must be right. Make sense? Everybody kind of sort of okay with that? Yes. Let's do another example. 
Oh, I don't know. Let's say we have, I don't even know, let's say we have bromine. Bromine, I don't know, 81. Loses alpha. Now, let me just be clear with you guys. I have no idea if this even exists, and if it does, I don't know if it gives off alpha. But for the sake of this exercise, let's just say it does, okay? So if you go home and you Google it, you say, wait a minute, Romy 81 doesn't even exist? Okay, you got me. <laughs> um, but for purposes of this exercise, this will work, okay? Now, we may not actually be able to do this in reality, but in order to figure it out, this is a perfectly good question. Okay. So bromine is atomic number. We run over here to the bromine and we say bromine is atomic number 35. Okay, good. So we know the atomic number of bromine, 35. Now, it's losing helium. So we're gonna lose two protons from the nucleus. Is that good? Everybody? So how many protons do we have left? 33. Run back to the periodic table. Element 33 is? AS. A-S, one of those unpronounceable ones. A-S, there we go. Now, what's the mass number of the A-S? 77. Now, to check yourself to see if you're right, add them up. 4 plus 77 is 81. 2 plus 33 is 35. One last thing, make sure A-S is 33. Run back to the table, double check. AS33, we must be right, okay? Now, again, if you Google that, it probably doesn't work, probably not real, but for the exercise, I love it, perfectly good. Did everyone see how to do it? Yes. Pretty simple, right? Yes. Well, that is a nuclear decay. That's your first nuclear decay. Aren't you excited? Yeah. Yes, we are actually excited. Thank you for asking. <laughs> All right, beta emission. Beta is a little more complicated, but not much. Now. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Beta is the loss of an electron. And that should have you scratching your head a little bit. Because you know, or at least I told you, maybe I'm a liar, mm -hmm. but I told you, and the book even confirms this, that the nucleus has protons and neutrons, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that radioactive uh, isotopes of elements kick things out of their nucleus, right? Mm -hmm. And now I'm saying that a beta particle is an electron emitted from the nucleus. And that's when I would be like, what are you talking about? How can we lose an electron from the nucleus? Anyone? Yeah, the nucleus breaks down. Ha! I don't know if that's true, but that sounds good to me. The nucleus breaks down. Why not, right? What happens in reality is very complicated. Oh, don't forget that there. There you go. What happens in reality is complicated. And I'm not even going to begin to explain it. I tried to have one of the professors here explain it to me. He started talking about gluons, and I laughed, and I thought he was kidding. And he wasn't. They're seriously called gluons, and they do all kinds of weird stuff. Then he started talking about two guys in a fishing boat, and I'm like, whatever, man. I'm good. I'm good. But it's a little bit more complicated than this. But how do I think of this? I think of it exactly the way you, you just said it. The neutron gives up an electron. Okay. If you want to think about it like this, now this is not right, but think about it in this way. In the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. Remember back when we looked at the masses of things and we said a neutron is slightly heavier than a proton? If you actually took the mass of a proton and added the mass of an electron, it's almost equal to a neutron. Almost, not quite. So think of it that way. It's not really this way, but think of it. Think of a neutron as a fusion of a proton and an electron together. It's not really, but think of it that way. In a beta emission, the neutron decides that the that the elect the sorry the neutron decides that it's going to kick out the electron. So the proton is sitting there, nice and happy with the electron, and then decides, you know what, I don't need to do anymore. Throws it out. Think, try to think of it that way. It's kind of hand wavy, but that's how I like to think of it. Are you with me so far? So if that's true, if that's true, then let's write that down. Let's just write all this down so we have a good record of it. It's not true, it's not actually how it works, but it's a helpful way to think about it. Beta emission. The nucleus. Uh, let's not do that, let's say the neutron. Will emit one electron 
plus one proton. Okay? So what happens? The neutron will break down, one electron will get spit out, and one proton will remain in the nucleus. Okay? So think of the proton as, as a pitcher. The electron's the ball, the proton just threw the ball to home plate, but the pitcher didn't leave the pitcher's mouth. Okay? Think of it kind of that way. So, if, for example, what are these for an example here? Carbon 14, that's good. Carbon 14 is going to lose beta. Okay, let's be careful here. It's going to lose beta. So that's a beta particle. Carbon's atomic number should be six, yeah? Yeah, six. So we're going to lose, going to lose beta. Okay, now beta. Now a neutron is a proton plus an electron. If we throw out the electron, we have one less nucleate, neutron and one more proton, right? Everybody? So now we've changed elements, right? We have one more proton. Does that make sense to everybody? So we're going to be element number seven, which is nitrogen. Okay? Let's write that down. This should be element number seven, which is nitrogen, and the mass number should be 14. Shouldn't change. Okay? All that's happened in beta emission is that you lose one neutron but gain a proton. Okay? Now, just like in alpha particles, this needs to balance. 14 plus zero equals 14, right? Everybody? Yes. yes. Seven minus one is six. So they balance just like that. Go ahead. All right. So on the top, on the top number you move from left to right. On the bottom number you move from right to left. I go follow. <laughs> Try that again. All right. So on the bottom, how? Yep. How you? Okay. Did you, did you see it? Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. You're not just being shy? No. Okay, good. No. <laughs> right, so basically, think of, it, think of this as this, we use a proton, sorry, the electron gets ejected from the nucleus, and a proton remains in the nucleus. So you go up one proton, okay? And then the numbers still balance at the end. All right, let's do an example of this that's not on the board. Again, I don't know if what I'm about to draw even works, but I'm going to make it up anyway. Beta emission. Let's say we have hydrogen 3 is going to give us a beta emission. And what will our product be? So what will happen there? Well, hydrogen atomic number 1. Okay. So hydrogen 3 is going to lose beta. So what will our new product be? Helium, right? Atomic number 2, yeah? Everybody agree? A few people agree, okay. So we got hydrogen, loses a beta particle, forms a helium atom. So element number 2 is helium. Now what's the ato atomic, sorry, what's the mass number? 3. Okay. They'll so form helium-3. I don't even know if helium-3 exists. But that process to figure that out is what we had to do. Okay? Now, on an exam, if I give you these kind of questions, um, don't worry about whether they exist in nature or not. Just worry about doing the process. Uh, the only way I know how to find out what isotopes are radioactive is I use Google. Honestly, that's how I look it up. I don't know which ones are radioactive. I know I believe this carbon-14 is radioactive, and that's probably the only one. Uh, hydrogen-3 is radioactive, but I don't know how they emit. Uh, that's stuff I will just look up. Okay? So don't worry about figuring out what isotopes are radioactive in this course. Uh, just worry about how to deal with them once you see them. All right. Let's try that one. Write the nuclear equation for the beta decay of cobalt-60. Excuse me. Give that one the old try on your own.
Who's got it? A few folks? Who's still turning it up? Did you find it hard? It's pretty straightforward, right? So you just open this one up for us, for sure. All right, who doesn't have it? Who still wants to do a little more time? Anyone? A little more time? Okay. We have cobalt 60 going to lose an electron. Cobalt is element number 27. So let's put 27 right here real quick. 27. All right, now, if one of the neutrons in cobalt 60 decides to get rid of an electron, we're going to have one more proton in the nucleus. Is that correct? So it will be element 61. Oh, no, sorry, 28. Excuse me. Which is what? Nickel. Oh, cool. We form a little nickel. Now we can make some money. And what would the mass number be? 60. 60. stays the same. There we go. So that's how you do it. Now, who had trouble with that? Anybody? I have a question. Um, I was looking at the, the notes. Um, it doesn't matter if the problem is switched around. If it's like, if you put the, uh, you know, the nickel first and then the um, actual equation for beta at the other side. Oh, you mean just take this one here and put it there? Yeah. No, it yeah. makes no difference. It's personal problem. preference, whatever oh. you want to do. Probably, like, if you're going to write it down for a professional journal or, or someone, you know, for publication, uh, probably the element would go first and the particle. Uh, that's probably proper convention. Uh, for the purposes of here, no. So whatever you like, whatever you like to do first, whatever gets you to the right answer, I'm okay with it. All right, very good. So that's pretty simple for you guys, right? All right. So we can move right along to something... More interesting, we're not doing positron emissions, so don't worry about it. Gamma, now, all I really want you to learn about gamma is first of all, gamma is one of the most dangerous ones. Now that doesn't mean that if you get any gamma radiation exposure, you're gonna die, it doesn't mean that. It just means that it's one of the ones that you have to be careful with. So the first reason why you have to be careful with gamma is if you're not protected from gamma radiation, gamma radiation can go right through you. Which well, doesn't sound so bad until you think about this. When gamma radiation goes through you, it starts messing with yourself. It starts, you know, starts messing up a little bit, uh, which may or may not be a problem. But the more exposure you get, the more likelihood it is you're going to have a problem. I.e., the problem usually develops as cancer because the, it causes mutation in your DNA and all kinds of bad nonsense you don't want. So you want to protect yourself. So if you're going to protect yourself from gamma. One meter of concrete should do it, or a big old lead brick. Now, a gamma emitter will have this, that right there, that M, that's a gamma emitter. So if you're reading the label on something that comes into your facility and it has a big old warning label on it, first of all, and you see the letter M in the mass number, that bad boy is radioactive. So be careful of it. Now, if you ever go to work in, a, especially at a bigger hospital or the big hospitals, or any hospital really, you will get lots of nuclear chemistry training, on, especially on safety, because it's required by the federal government. So, don't worry too much about it. When you get there, they will train you hardcore on how to do stuff. Uh, but just so you know, you ever see that M? That M means gamma emitter. So when you emit gamma, say from technetium, what you get is you will still have technetium but you'll get gamma radiation. You get gamma energy, okay? So that's just what happens. That's all I need you to know about uh, gamma. On a multiple choice question, what you might get is I might show you that exact equation, and I would say, what kind of radiation will technetium emit? And it'll be alpha, beta, gamma, none of the above, or something like that. And you will say, it's a gamma emitter. How do you know? Because of the M in the mass number, okay? Make sense? <coughs> That's just the convention. That's how they do it. 
So that's how you know. Also, the package will say warning, radioactive, warning, gamma emitter, warning, warning, warning. There'll be millions of warnings on this thing. All right. Uh, don't worry about that. We're not talking about that today either. Measuring radioactivity. Write that word down. Geiger counter. G-E-I-G-E-R from the word counter. I don't think we have one in this school. I should ask them to get one. Is it, is it expensive? No, not really. I mean, expensive is relative, right? Yeah. You can buy one. You can get one on Amazon. I mean, they're, they're legal though. How much? I don't know. Amazon, I don't know. I, I have friends that have them, just for fun. <laughs> All right, now, a, a Geiger counter literally just detects radiation. Beta and gamma, it cannot detect alpha. And really, it's not that complicated to use. You just turn it on, and then you, you hold the wand at a surface that you think might be radioactive or have contamination on it. And what will happen, two things, depending on the meter you get, the, the, better, the better meters have both. They have a little visual readout where you can see the needle move, and they click. They usually click. So if you go up, hold the wand out, so you have your little counter, you hold the wand out to the air like this, you might hear, you know, click. That's called background radiation. So you're going to get radiation no matter where you go, for the most part. So you're going to get what's called background. So they just a click every so many seconds. No big deal. Harmless. Don't worry about it. If you know, you're know you taking a little thing and you're surveying a floor, which if you go to a hospital that does this kind of work, you may see the guy at the Geiger counter, usually at night, walking through, waving the wand back and forth in front of him. He's checking for activity on the floor. Um, when you have a lot of people working with radioactivity, you've got to survey the building now and then to make sure the building's clean. Uh, if you ever hear the thing go, how to take the day off? Uh, it means there's contamination somewhere. But most places are very, 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 very regimented with this stuff, and there's never going to be a problem because they're so serious about it. So anyway, they're fun. If you go into your home, if you want to know where the most radioactive thing in your home is, it's your fire, it's your uh, smoke alarm. Take a Geiger counter to that, it'll go crazy. Why? Because there's an element called Americanium inside of it that helps that require the detector needs to the detect smoke, gives off electricity to the alarm, and the alarm just goes not. So uh, there are some, I believe, that don't have radiation in them anymore. But if you open it up and look inside, you might see a little radioactive symbol inside of it. And it's probably radioactive. But hey, don't put your face in it. You will know, be fine if you don't do that. But like, if you stand like just a meter away from it, you won't even detect it. So it's up above you. So, you know, All right, units for measuring radiation. Here are the three most common. Please write them down. Curie. Curie measures the activity in numbers of atoms that decay in a second. So you want that number to be low. Most of the time, things are purchased and sold in micro or million curie. You don't usually buy a whole curie of anything, because that's a lot of radiation at one time. The red, that's your radiation absorbed dose. That's the radiation that your body has absorbed. Now, if you work at a hospital or some kind of radioactive, radioactive place, they will give you chest badges. Some of you may actually see these. Chest badges and usually a ring to wear on your finger, a little uh, radioactive ring. And that's just there to measure how much you've been exposed to over a month. So, for example, if you're working with radiation, you're wearing your badges, and you get exposed to, say, I don't know, two or three rads in a month, no big deal. If, on the other hand, if your radiation detector comes back and you've been exposed to lots and lots of rads, they'll pull you off the job. They'll give you something else to do because you've been exposed to too much. Okay? REM, that measures the biological damage caused by the different types of radiation. So um, you want that number to be low too. If it's high, so if it's just gamma, the REM should be very high, pretty dangerous. Beta, pretty low, not that bad. All right, those are your three main types that we, that we use here in the US to measure radiation. Now I'm never gonna ask you to calculate how many curries per second or anything like that. What I do want you to know is what these three things are and be able to uh, identify them on a multiple choice. So, and that's because if you ever work at a place and you see a package that says, you know, something about milliaturies or rounds, you might want to stay away from it unless you need to use it. And if you're not trained to use it, please do not touch it. It would be very dangerous.
Oh, it's Friday, by the way. <laughs> we only got five more minutes, too, so stay with me. Ready? Go. All right. Uh, real quick on Half-Life. I want to just define Half-Life. The Half-Life of a radioisotope is the time it takes for half of your radioactivity to disappear. That's what it means. So let's say, for example, uh, iodine-131. Iodine-131. And let's say, for argument's sake, we have 100 atoms. We have 100 atoms of iodine-131. It has an eight-day half-life. So that means that every eight days, it will go in half. So after eight days, you'll have 50 atoms of iodine-131. Let's say eight more days go by. Now you'll have 25 atoms of iodine-151. Eight more days. You'll have 12.5 atoms of iodine 151, oh, 131, sorry. Okay, and so on. I think I can stop there, you all get it. Every eight days, whatever you have falls in half. Okay, so what you'll notice on the Earth, because the Earth's been around for so long, is most of our um, elements are not radioactive. Why? Because they had enough time, if they were radioactive, they've had enough time to decay, to become non-radioactive. You see what I'm saying? So here we had 100 I uh, atoms of iodine after 2, 8, 16, 24 days, now we only have 12.5. Wait another 24 days, you'll have essentially nothing. You'll have a little bit, but essentially nothing. Okay? That's why there's not many radioactive isotopes on the Earth. When we want to have them, for medical reasons, we have to make them. Okay, we make them with a process called uh, fusion and other, other processes that we won't go over in this class. All right, so half-life is the time it takes for half of your radioactive material to dissipate or go away or not be around anymore. Okay, that's what I want you to know. Don't write this down, just look, look with me. Notice the top, those are all naturally occurring uh, isotopes of some elements. Notice uranium has a half-life of 4.5 times 10 to the 9 years. That's uranium-238. That is essentially not radioactive. Okay? Carbon, look at that one. Thought. Carbon-14, that isotope of carbon, 5,730 years. Long time. So it's very, really not radioactive. At the bottom, though, the medically relevant ones, we're looking at for chromium, 28 days. Technetium, six hours. Okay? So we gotta make these things because they don't last very long. They make them and ship them. And then you use them for whatever medical purposes you have, and that's how it's done. But notice the medically useful ones have very short half-lives. Okay? That's because you need to have that radiation source to do whatever medical test you're trying to accomplish. We are not doing any half-life calculations. I learned my lesson hard way not. Okay. Um, you can just read this part if you want. I'm not that concerned about you knowing that. That's something that you'll learn when you get there. If you want to read about medical applications, feel free. It's in your textbook. Feel free to read it all day long. <laughs> Nuclear fission and fusion. Write that title section down for me, please. Nuclear fission and fusion. And with the two minutes remaining, please write down that definition. Nuclear fission. A large nucleus is bombarded with a small one. That basically makes the nuclei unstable and it will split apart. Bottom point is the most important. Lots and lots of free energy, well not free, but lots and lots of energy. Okay? Now, I'm sorry that I had to go through chapter nine pretty quick. Uh, we are way behind, but now we're pretty much caught up because of this. I hit the high points in chapter nine. I'm gonna hit a few more next time I see you. And we're gonna go right into 10. So, please read chapter nine. What I showed you here in class is pretty much what I'm going to test you on, if I test you on it, okay? I'm not saying that I won't, but I'm not promising you that I will either. So make sure you know the high points and read the chapter so you understand it. All right?
With that, thank you for sticking with me. I will see you next week.